Hi, welcome to another episode of Quick and Dirty Yoga Philosophy. I'm Molly Lanning Kenny, and today we're going to talk about the eight limbs of yoga. So, the eight limbs of yoga are a construct that was codified by a sage named Patanjali. Now, there's a lot of mystery around Patanjali. Um, he's said to have lived somewhere between three and 5,000 years ago. Um, scholars believe that he may have been an attorney, um, a writer, certainly a scholar. Um, some people even think that maybe it, uh, the person that was eventually called Patanjali was actually a group of people that, that codified this information together. And uh, if you see an icon or a statue of Patanjali, he's generally depicted with the body of a man, but then pretty much like below the navel, he becomes a snake. So who knows? But anyway, this character Patanjali codified some of the prevailing wisdom and the conventional wisdom of his era in India. So these different ideas and philosophical forms that the sages and rishis were working with at this time, Patanjali ended up codifying into a text called the Yoga Sutras. Sutra, the word sutra, um, has the same root as something like suture. So sutra actually means something like thread. Sanskrit is actually the oldest Euro, Euro excuse me, Indo-European language. Um, and so we actually have a lot of cognates in English with Sanskrit. So the eight limbs of yoga are described in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. When we talk about yoga in general, or talking about these eight limbs, um, there's lots of different ways that yoga is described and, um, and yoga is taught. Um, lots of different things that people think of when they think of yoga. Um, and what we're gonna talk about right now is what we call Raja Yoga. And Raja Yoga is the yoga of practice. So Raja means like the, the royal yoga. And so the, the royal yoga is said to be what, that we get to the state of yoga, we get to the state of self-realization, God-realization through very specific practices. Now there are other paths of yoga, there are other ways that we can get to that state of yoga. Um, we can get there through devotion, we can get there through selfless service, we can get there through uh, study of oneself, but one way that we can get there is through practice. So the seminal text of Raja Yoga, the seminal text of uh, the yoga of practice is Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Patanjali's Yoga Sutras is divided into four sections. The second section is called the portion on practice. So that portion on practice is really the part that lays out very specific ways for us to attain that state of yoga or that state of self-realization, that state of God realization. Uh, Sometimes people will say that yoga is both the means and the end. So in other words, we practice yoga in order to get to the state of yoga. So yoga is both the practice and it's also the place that we arrive. It's the realization of our oneness with the divine. So in the portion on practice, chapter two, of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, the idea of the eight limbs is laid out for us. The eight limbs uh, are also called sometimes Ashtanga. The word for eight in Sanskrit is Ashto, the word for limb is Anga. When those two words go together, it becomes Ashtanga. So Ashtanga literally means eight limbs. Now I just want to say briefly that there's also a style of yoga that's called Ashtanga Yoga and that's what you might you know, go to a yoga studio and they say, oh, the six o'clock class is Ashtanga Primary Series or you might have a friend that says, what kind of yoga do you do? And they say, I do Ashtanga Yoga. They're talking about a very specific physical methodology that was taught and propagated by Patabi Joyce, um, a, uh, a yoga scholar and yoga teacher who died very recently at the age of his late 80s, early 90s. That gentleman's name 
was Patabi Joyce. And so that's a contemporary teacher that taught this particular method, this particular style of movement-based yoga, of physical yoga. And that's also called Ashtanga. So that can be a little bit confusing. In this case, we're not talking about the Ashtanga yoga. We're not talking about the method as put forward by, by Patabi Joyce for, for movement and poses, but we're talking about the eight limbs, a philosophical framework that was put forth by Patanjali. So the eight limbs of yoga are described in, in the portion on practice, and I'm going to list them out for you right now. And I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of how we get to these. So one thing that's important for us to think about is that this, these eight limbs are not directly sequential. So it's not like, oh, we master the first one and then we move on to the next one. Then we master the second one, we get on to the next one until we, until we get to the final one. Um, I like to think of this, it's an analogy for me of like climbing a tree, right? So we've got this tree and it's got all its different branches. And if I wanted to climb up this tree, I might start here and then maybe I would climb up to get here, but then maybe I have to put a foot down here to, to brace myself. So if I'm climbing a tree, although generally I'm moving upward, there's certainly the sense that I might take one step up, but then maybe I'd have to take a step down in order to steady myself or in order to be able to reach something else. That's one of the ways that we can think about this eight-limbed path that it's not totally linear, although it is um, all are wanting to arrive at its sort of culmination. So I'm actually going to go <coughs> uh, backwards on this part and then forwards on this part, and hopefully that won't be too confusing. I actually think it might help to illuminate a little bit. So number eight of the limbs is samadhi. And samadhi could be called yoga itself, or the state of yoga, we might call it. Um, or we might call it self-realization, or God-realization. So this idea that we would ultimately do this practice and, and we get to something, we'd attain something, what it is that we would attain is samadhi. What it is that we would attain is total absorption in the sense of unity, unification with the divine. So a sense that there is no difference between me and Brahman, the me and God, me and the divine. And in fact then, there's also no difference between, at some essential level, there's no difference between me and everything around me. So if you go back and look at lesson two on the Kleshas, I talk a little bit more about that idea, the difference between me as a material body and me as divine consciousness. So samadhi is realization of oneself as part of that divine consciousness. So that's our goal. So right before I get to that goal, I, as a matter of fact, I'm going to go the other way. Now I am going to start back here. So instead, I'm going to start, uh, we're, so we know we're going. We're going to that state of samadhi. So we're going to get there through this path. We have yama and niyama. Those are the first two. So those are both ethical precepts. So these are sometimes people call them like the Ten Commandments of yoga. I suppose you could look at them that way if that's a framework that's helpful for you. The yama uh, are what we call our restraints. So sometimes people say these are like the no's. And then niyama are the observances. And those are like the yeses. Yeses. Not sure how you would spell that. And so one of the things, I mentioned that guy, Patabi Joyce, the contemporary teacher. An interesting thing that he used to say is that he wouldn't even start people at this level because he thought in order for us to really be able to get into our hearts, get into our minds, have some control over that, have the open heart and mind that allows us to act in an ethical way, that we would first have to have some control over our physical body. That's going to be number three, is asana. 
So he actually believed that we should start at this place, asana, which is the movement, because if we couldn't control our body, there was no way we were gonna be able to control our mind anyway. He was very famous for the phrase, do your practice, all is coming. And in fact, he meant that if you worked on this asana part, that some of these precepts would begin to reveal themselves to you. Yama and Niyama, there's five of each of them. So on that particular tree branch, it would have five little like sub limbs, we could say. And on episode four of Quick and Dirty, I'll go ahead and lay out Yama and Niyama very specifically. So be looking forward to that. Right now, I'm just going to list them out for you along with their definitions so that we can get through to everything. So on this side, our observances, we have Ahimsa, Satya, Asteya, Brahmacharya, and Aparigraha. So these are the restraints. These are the sort of things like, don't do these things. So Ahimsa is about non-violence. So non-harming, cultivating gentleness and kindness. Satya is truthfulness. So it's both telling the truth, but it's also being with the truth, being the reality of what with, being with the reality of whatever's happening in the moment. Asteya is non-stealing. Brahmacharya is continence or moderation, but it's also celibacy. And again, in the next episode, we'll unpack that a little bit more. And then finally, aparigraha is non-grasping or non-hoarding. So these are all the things that we're like restraining ourselves, like restraining ourselves from being violent, restraining ourselves from speaking or living untruths, restraining ourselves from taking what is not ours, and so on. On the other hand, we have Niyama, so that's the other one over here, and that's the one that I said, these are the yeses, these are our, um, our observances. So for Niyama, we have Shaucha, Santosha, Tapas, Svadhyaya, and Ishvara Pranidana. And so these, briefly, Shaucha is cleanliness, or also we could say orderliness, purity. Santosha is contentment. Tapas is like will, uh, determination, we could call it. And again, I'll do another episode just on the Niyamas. I'll unpack these more. Svadhyaya is self-inquiry. And Ishvara Pranidana is surrender to God. So these are the things that we're, we are observing, that we are wanting to cultivate a sense of cleanliness, a sense of contentment in the moment, our will, our enthusiasm for spiritual life and, and evolution, self-inquiry, like who am I? What is the nature of my being? And Ishvara Pranidana is, is at some point saying, this is just how it's going. I just need to um, have that sense of surrender and see how my life unfolds. So those are the first two limbs, Yama and Niyama. We could spend probably a lifetime just on those. We won't. But in your own practice, you might think about how that long that would take. Then we have asana and pranayama. So these are the things we generally learn in yoga class. Asana is the movement. So it's poses, movement. This is literally translated as steady, comfortable seat. And in fact, in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, he only talks about asana twice. Once when he lists it with the eight limbs and once when he defines it as a steady, comfortable seat. So it's an interesting thing for us to note that in the West, we're generally practicing what we think of as Raja Yoga when we're doing all these bendy athletic poses. And in fact, it's not even a big part of yoga as laid out in that way. So that's just something interesting. This, this book is much more about meditation, in fact. Pranayama is, um, for our sake right now, we're gonna call it breathing techniques, but it, what it really is, is about um, an ability to manage or control vital energy. 
or we might say life force. And in uh, yoga we call that prana. In the Chinese medicine it's called qi or even qi. Uh, so it's our ability to control our life force, to control our energy by using the breath. So doing things like long, steady, controlled deep breathing, alternate nostril breathing, all of those things are techniques for controlling vital energy. That's pranayama. So we have yama, niyama, asana, pranayama. I'm gonna go on to the next five although, excuse me, next four, although we really only have three because we've done a cup, we've done samadhi. So we have four, then we have five, six, seven, eight. Remember that eight is samadhi. That's that sort of self-realization. So we've done the, the ethical precepts, yama, niyama, then we have the movement, asana, then we have pranayama, which is managing our life force through managing the breath. Following that, we move into pratyahara, Pratyahara is literally is withdrawal of the senses. And this whole part is something that I often use as um, a way for people to think about meditation when they think like, oh my gosh, I'm not doing it right, or uh, I've been practicing for so long, but I can't get my mind to not wander. One of the things I remind them is that where you're thinking of this idea of meditation, maybe you haven't even mastered that. Maybe you haven't even mastered withdrawal of the senses. So what that means is maybe I'm on my yoga mat and I'm doing my different poses and I'm doing my different breathing, but then I think about like, oh shoot, I wonder if I left the stove on, or I wonder if I moved the laundry along, or I think, um, or oh, what's that smell? Oh, that person next to me. Oh, you know, they have on too much patchouli, or oh, what's that noise? Or I don't like this music, or whatever it might be. That's all of our sensory, um, like antennae, like going outward and distracting us. So once we have gotten a little bit better at the movement and the breath, what we can really start to think about is how can I get better at not being distracted by all that outward sensory information and instead I draw my senses inward so I might be aware that a thought came through my mind but then it's gone already. I might be aware that there's a smell that I like or don't like but then it's gone already so I can withdraw my senses inward. That's the fifth limb. As I begin to be able to, to withdraw my senses inward, I will be better able to concentrate. That's vedana, concentration. So now I'm not being so distracted by outside things or even things that are being generated from my own mind, which is considered to be one of the senses, but I can actually concentrate on one thing. So now, not only am I not being distracted outward, all of my focus can be on my breath or all my focus is on my mantra, or all my focus is on the idea of compassion, or all my focus is on the vision of Jesus Christ, or Sri Ramakrishna, or the Buddha, or whoever it might be, that I can really focus my concentration. Once I've been able to really focus my concentration, according to Patanjali, I have then come to the step that is actually meditation. When I'm meditating, I no longer am having the experience of like, oh, I'm concentrating on this thing. Let's say I had been, <laughs> welcome to Mexico. Let's say I had been concentrating on uh, a lotus flower. When I get to meditation, that lotus flower image dissolves and I am now absorbed so much that there's no difference between me and the lotus flower. That I'm so much a sense of absorption that I'm not thinking about anything. I don't even have to concentrate anymore. Then I've reached meditation. Once I've reached meditation, then I go right to, hopefully, samadhi that I've concentrated and now I'm in that place where there's no difference between, they say, the seer in the sea or the object in the observer. I feel that sense of union. I feel that dissolution of separateness. And in that dissolution of separateness, I now experience samadhi, self-realization. That is the eight limbs, quick and dirty. Yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. Hope that helped. Thanks so much and see you soon. Adios. Que te vaya bien.